Welcome to the global virtual press conference for American fiction. Yeah. yeah. I'm your moderator, Sean Edwards, yeah. Critics' Choice Association board member and executive producer for Celebration of Black Cinema. Yeah. And we're here to talk about this fantastic film, American fiction. Now, we got a lot of talent coming out and not a lot of time, but we've made it easy for everyone watching virtually. Just go to the chat function if you have a question. If you're here, Live and in person, you got a QR code. Go to that QR code, scan the QR code, punch your question in, and hopefully we'll get to it. But right now, let's get down to our business of order. The cast and filmmakers of American Fiction. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, to my left, director, writer, Cord Jefferson. Thank you. Thank you. One of the greatest actors of our generation, if not the greatest, Mr. Jefferson Wright. What's better than one classic sitcom? Two. Yes. Our girlfriends and blackish. Tracy Ellis Ross. Yeah, yeah. Randall, Randall. My buddy from Randall. St. Louis, Missouri. Uh -oh. yeah. <laughs> Sterling K. Brown. Yeah. Randall. Celebrating the 30th anniversary of living single. Yeah. Woo! Erica Alexander. Right, PR in the house. Yeah. Mr. John Ortiz. <laughs> One of the coolest guys on the planet, Mr. Adrian Brody. <laughs> Welcome to this discussion and conversation we're about to have about right American fiction, which is actually rooted in some nonfiction. Mm. So I would like to start with the cast first and find out from you guys, starting first with Mr. Jeffrey Wright. What gave you the confidence and what led you to want to be a part of this project that was written and directed by first time filmmaker, Cord Jefferson? What made you say yes and what gave you the confidence to go? Confidence to go. Um, Cord sent me a wonderful invitation to this project. He sent me the script and he sent along with that a letter saying that uh, uh, he had read the script, or, or rather read the novel and written the script and very early on uh, heard my voice uh, in his head as this character. I did apologize to him for that, because um, <laughs> I know how tricky that can be. Um, and, and he also said, and I have no plan B. <laughs> um, so that was, that was pretty flattering. I don't often, it happens occasionally, but I don't often get, uh, you know, scripts that are kind of designed, uh, you know, with, with me in mind. Um, and then when I read it, uh, the membrane between my life and that character's life was, was infin infinitesimally thin. And uh, it wasn't really a matter of confidence. It was kind of more uh, necessity. Uh, I just said, yeah, I, I, I can tell this story. I know this man's journey, particularly um, his relationship to um, the family, um, the necessity of, of becoming caretaker to she who was his caretaker. That was a, a very close uh, um, um, experience uh, or one that I knew uh, probably too intimately, and I think Cord can speak to that as well. But there were just a number of overlaps. The script was so finely tuned, the satire, the irony, the, I, I just, you know, I understood the music and, and I, uh, I hopped on board. And for you, Miss Ross. Um, without just doing my best to be brief, the material, the script was incredibly written. I was drawn in from the first moment. Um, uh, Cord, Everybody says he's a first-time director, but he's not a first-time human. Um, and he's a, 
He's just a substantial person that is incredibly intelligent. Um, I'm going to talk about you while you're here. That's all right. All right. <laughs> she said incredibly intelligent. Yeah. <laughs> incredibly intelligent. Usually, by the way, guys, doesn't wear socks. So I'm really convinced today. Um, holding uh, the ankles. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. Incredibly intelligent and really clear and strong point of view, but doesn't have ego which is a very um, unique and special thing that lends itself beautifully to a director who gives his actors space, but also knows what he wants. But on the page, it was extraordinary, and the character itself, this role, I'll just quickly say, um, the fact that she was a Planned Parenthood doctor was very interesting to me. Um, the fact that she was holding this space in this family uh, in filling in the gaps that so many black women do in the world and to give life to that woman was really important to me. Um, and working with Joe Ray Ray. <laughs> <laughs> Did I say it loud enough? <laughs> Jeffrey Wright. That really got me. That was my brief note. That was good. That was good. That was, good. That was, that was, that was, that was, that was yeah, solid. Yeah, yeah. Solidly okay. brief. Yeah. I was going to say, like, I was thinking about Cord and his sort of, like, not having a plan B. And if I was Cord, I, sometimes I imagine myself playing the part of Cord Jefferson and trying to figure out how I would cast this thing. And I was like, who is light-skinned enough, right? But also has short enough hair, who doesn't wear socks all the time. I was like... Jeffrey Wright. <laughs> Jeffrey Wright reminds me of me. Uh, anyway, the <laughs> irony is I see myself as blue-black in Come turn. On. <laughs> I love that. In the nat <laughs> It makes me really happy. <laughs> I'm Fred Douglas on this way. Um, I, um, yeah, well, listen, listen. <laughs> what, what gave me confidence in it is uh, the script, like everyone else has said, and the desire to put that story out into the world. Uh, the desire to expand how the media can see us, because sometimes it has been more narrowly defined, uh, to see the banality and normalcy of people dealing with day-to-day -day troubles who happen to look like us, and the idea that it was written so well, because I think I never underestimate the power of a story well told, and the fact that it gets to be populated with people with melanin makes me really excited, and then hopefully It'll make money, and then we get a chance to make more of them. That's yeah. it. All right, Miss Erica Alexander. Well, if this is Frederick Douglass and that's Nat Turner, I'm Harry Tubman. <laughs> <laughs> and we all know who that makes me. <laughs> Shoot. How did we go here? <laughs> I do consider myself her child, but I have skin in the game. We all do. We have. We need to have these conversations. I was really, really honored to be invited to it by Cord Jefferson, who laid out what he wanted to do, um, why he saw me in the role, and it's really nice to go where you're invited, where people you don't have to prove what you've done, you don't have to convince anybody that they're already seeing you in a place, standing next to people not only that you admire, that you aspire to, that you really are rooting for in life and. Hopefully they've been rooting for you, and that's been my whole experience. So I'm really grateful for this, and um, I think that America. This I love this called Ameri American fiction, because we're all living in a fiction of some sort, and we need to start telling more truths. So I'm really glad to be here. All right, great yeah. answer. Great yeah. answer. Yeah. All right, all right, sir John. All right, yes, uh, yeah. The script, um, which I read before I was officially invited. Um, and after reading it, hands down, I told my manager, this is the best screenplay I've ever read. Um, and then I heard that he was interested in me playing the role of the agent. And that was refreshing <laughs> for me. And I was like, I really want to do it. And then I met him, Cord, and that gave me the confidence because not only did I feel seen, seen, but I understood his connection to the material. I understood his passion for the material, for the story. I understood his care as he was showing me drawings of Arthur's desk. You know, 
in like a really deep way. And I was like, it's just a desk. And he's like, no, no, it's not just a desk. It's like Arthur's desk. And I was like, all right, all right, I like this guy, you know? And that, to me, that's what it's all about. It's about, at the end of the day, the personal. And when the personal is rooted in the way that I felt it was rooted with Cord in this story, I was all in. And for you, Adam? Well, if, if they're Harriet Tubman and... from John Brown. <laughs> <laughs> um, like most actors, I've been a long-term uh, Jeffrey Wright fan, long-time Jeffrey Wright fan, and so uh, first and foremost, um, an opportunity to have a few scenes one-on-one -on -one with him was very, very exciting for me. I thought the script was very funny, very intelligent, very touching. I was very curious to see how these two seemingly very different storylines coexisted to, um, um, with each other. And um, let's see, I showed up in Boston. I met Cord and Jeffrey uh, that morning on set. I was done by lunch. And um, here I am. <laughs> All these wonderful actors I saw. That's, that's the best answer ever. Man. It's all about honesty, baby. Keep it honest. Keep it, Keep it authentic. Now, I know each and every one of you, there's, there's a through line that just happened. Everybody mentioned the script. The script's incredible. Yeah. And, you know, you can't do anything without a script. Can't even do this without a script. But I have to press pause and go off script right now. I think we can't go any further without giving a shout out and paying respect to someone in the film that isn't here, mm. that allowed us all to be here, whether mm. we're sitting in the front row wow. or in the audience. Mm. Can we please show some love for Leslie? Yeah. 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 Could you do me the honors, Jeffrey? Because I think you spent the most screen time with her in the film. Talk about the impact of not only working with her, but just having her presence on set and being involved with this project. Because like I said, I don't even come up with the concept to create Celebration of Black Cinema if it wasn't for someone like the Leslie Uggams. Well, I, I told her on the last day after uh, uh, we'd finished working together. I was in the hair and makeup trailer, and I said to her, I said, uh, I, 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 I have something that I must tell you. Um, since the ver very first time that I laid eyes on you, mother, I have had a crush on you. So have you saved it? I saved it. Saved it. <laughs> so as not to distract you. Kept that in your back pocket. <laughs> um, but... She, um, we had a conversation the other day, you know, about the, the some of the issues that are raised in the film, some of the uh, the issues that we face in terms of representation and 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 the like, and the ways in which we respond to them, and uh, and are we or are we not limited by those? And I, and I, I realized we were there with Leslie Uggams, mm. who, um, who is one of those who, you know. Who, who marched on the, the figurative Washington in, in terms of our industry. You know, going back to Burt Williams, and you know, you cross through Leslie Uggams. And Leslie told me that she actually, her career really started by winning the uh, uh, talent show at the Apollo when she was 14 or 15 years old or something like that. So not only, you know, is her, um, you know, I mean, her, her journey is seminal to our journeys, you know, we stand on her shoulders, and she is an absolute beautiful, generous collaborator, artist. She was thrilled to be there, and I'll tell a quick story about uh, what type of, uh, of artist she is. We were filming the scene, you've all seen it by now, I'm assuming, on the beach, and it was late September in uh, Situate, about 45 minutes south, east of, uh, of Boston, gorgeous little harbor town, little uh, uh, fishing village down there. Anyway, it was late fall, so, or mid fall, so it, it wasn't warm, it was cold, you know, she's out there, you know, practically barefoot, house coat and all of that walking. 
and just you know going back and forth and I'm down on the water with her and and, and the crew is up on this little seawall and I want to make sure she's okay so I'm court I think we I think she's okay we can do another one we can do it okay go. Leslie you're good yeah okay good and you know I'm walking back and forth and I'm super concerned you know that one for her health and also you know that we get the you know we get what we need you know so I said Leslie do you get you know I was in court do you think you can we can get one more she says she says yeah of course we're we're shooting a movie. Pull <laughs> <laughs> the camera. <laughs> Son. <laughs> I remember your lines. <laughs> I mean, she was just so committed, so clear, and just an, just an old pro. And, uh, yeah, uh, my thanks to her for being a part of this, but also for, uh, for all that she's allowed us to do. Uh, in, uh, in 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 our careers. Amen. No, thank you so much for sharing. Fantastic story. Appreciate that. Now for you, Mr. Jefferson. Okay. Yes. <laughs> it is your turn. All right. You know, we're in the business of creating lists. You know, it's like this is your feature debut, and I said to myself, man, we gotta we gotta redo the list. <laughs> it's like one of the all-time best feature debuts. Wow. But what led you to this journey? Why did you decide to choose this particular novel, Erasure, that was written by Percival Everett? And then how were you able to adapt it and be able to direct this film? <clears throat> oh, so before I was a, uh, before I worked in film and television, I was a journalist for about Oh, what, you were a journalist? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So you're saying, you're still telling the audience, they're going to come with it with the question. Yeah. <laughs> journalist versus journalist. Well, I, I don't know. Well, I mean, I haven't been, I'm out of practice. I haven't been a journalist for a while, so don't come with it that hard with the question. <laughs> uh, 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 I worked for, so out of college, I started working as a freelance journalist, and I sort of worked in all capacities as a journalist, but toward the end of my career, I was... Uh, I, I was working at Gawker. I was there from 2012 to 2014, and, and toward the end of my toward the end of my career, I published this article in 2014 at the end of my journalism career called "The Racism Beat," and it was about how I had reached this place in my career when, you know, uh, at, at, like weekly, somebody would come to me and they would say, "Do you want to write about Trayvon Martin being killed?" Uh, do you want to write about Breonna Taylor being killed? Do you want to write about Mike Brown being killed? Uh, do you want to write about this racist thing that somebody said about President Obama? And it, and it was, it just felt like this revolving door of misery constantly. Like that's what my job had become was, was to sort of uh, dissect the latest uh, violent tragedy in the black community. And it felt like, A, that is sort of uninspiring for me on a, on a, on a creative level, but then B, it was also like, what can I write about this that hasn't been written about this hundreds of times before, right? What can I write about this situation that had, wasn't written by Frederick Douglass and people like literally centuries ago, right? And the, mm -hmm. these are these sort of like as if I need to write something new about, about you know, it's difficult to try to come up with something uh, for every new sort of like tragedy. And so I was excited because when I got into film and television, it felt like, great, I'm no longer beholden to the realities of the world. It's sort of, we, we can write about black people in space, we can write about black people riding unicorns. Like we can do anything that we want to. It's sort of like anything that we can dream up, we can write. And lo and behold, it was it wasn't long before people came to me and they were like, "Do you want to write a movie about this black teenager being killed by police?" And I was like, "Do you want to write a movie about slaves? Do you want to write a movie about gang members? Do you want to write a movie about drug dealers?" And it just felt like, oh, even even in the world of fiction, there is such a severe limitation to what people think black life looks like. Even in the world of fantasy, where we can do anything, there's still such a limited perspective of black life. And uh, I was, you know, uh, that's, it's painful on a, it's painful on a sort of creative level, and it's, it's sort of obviously frustrating as somebody who wants to make work, but, but also sort of it's, 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 you know, it's painful because the, the, the implication there is that uh, black life does not have the breadth or depth of everybody else's life. That's sort of like we are defined by these, you know, five or six stories that we tell over and over again, largely that are about sort of like our ability to withstand pain and violence and suffering. And to me, it's like, the, you know, yes, I've had bad interactions with police officers that has happened in my life, but it doesn't happen often. And when it does happen, it's the least interesting thing that's happened to me that day, mm -hmm. right? Because it says nothing about who I am as a human being. Mm -hmm. 
sort of has says everything about the person who's, who's harassing me and sort of is, does nothing about my humanity or my identity. And so, you know, these are the things that were swirling around in my mind when I picked up the, the novel Erasure and it was dealing with these themes. And besides just those professional themes of what it means and, and sort of like the restrictions that people put on, on black writers, it was, you know, I have two older brothers. Uh, you know, I, I really understood the sibling dynamic that was being represented in the book. Uh, you know, we have a we have a very overbearing father figure who I love, but who looms large, and he, he was on set, so these people can speak to him. Have you ever heard you yes, talk he about him? I'm just wondering. Yeah. You say this every time. Oh yeah, no, okay, he's, okay, no, okay, he's cool. heard, oh, he believe me, believe me. I, I have knows. his voice in my head. <laughs> <laughs> Look after my boy. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. But so, so that sort of made sense. My mother didn't die of Alzheimer's, but my mother died of cancer about eight years ago. And and um, when she was when she was first sick, you know, like Lisa in the film, my oldest brother was was living in our hometown, and he was the one who took the responsibility of taking care of her and, and shopping for her and taking her to her appointments. And, you know, then I moved home at, at a certain point in time for the end of her life to help take care of her. So there was just all these things that I think that in order to make an adaptation that feels like there is some sort of like passion to it and not just kind of uh, a bloodless sort of money grab. It, it feels like the, the key is the key is kind of to find what you identify with in the material, like what really speaks to you. And there was so much in the novel that was speaking to me that it felt like, oh, this is this makes perfect sense for, for an adaptation for me. Because, it, you know, I'd never directed anything before this film. And, and, the, and you know, th that terrified me because, you know, I, I was I, I would talk to people and i say, well, you know, I don't know anything about lenses. I don't know anything about lighting. There's all these technical things that I don't understand. And then my friend would say, you know, you just need to have a vision. You can articulate that vision to other people who understand those things. And so... That's what really gave me the understanding the material at a fundamental level is what really gave me the courage to to move forward because I felt like even if I don't know these technical things necessarily, like I understand the story, I understand these people, I understand the story that we're trying to tell, and so as long as I use that as my roadmap, then I can sort of always go back to that in order to make these other decisions that I know less about. But I sort of I really knew. I knew this in my bones. See what I mean? Not a first-time human. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. All right, we'll do one more question and then we'll go to our audience questions. But I do want to ask you one question, Ms. Ross, about this film does a, such a beautiful job of creating this family dynamic, something that you've rarely seen portrayed with a black family in film. Not that you're an expert of family dynamics because you've done such a good job of that on television, but in film is a different... Because I have a family. Yeah, because you have a family, yes, exactly. Or I come from one. Or you come from one. I don't know, I don't actually know. Right. Have a family, so. <laughs> but talk about what it was like to, to sort of recreate that along with Jeffrey and along with Sterling. To... You know, it was interesting. I don't... We didn't work... We did not work together yeah. at all. Yeah. Which was fascinating. You left as I was coming. Yeah. But there was Processing. a dynamic that was, <laughs> that was on the page. And I also think the three of us come from family dynamics of siblings and they're at anyone who's Jeffrey only child. You're an only child. You're an only child. Yeah. How did I But I mean, you are my sister. Yeah. There you go. I'll take it. Why did I not catch that? Because you have two kids. Yeah. That's so interesting. I don't know. But the fa the dynamics of being a sibling and being a middle sibling yeah. is so specific yeah. and the roles that you play um, in your family system. And I think that was written on the page, but it was also really important to me that that was, that was the history that we were giving in the moments that we were together, that there was a real rapport of, there's something that happens with your siblings that's just unspoken. There's a way you know each other and a way that you speak to each other that you don't speak to anybody else Nobody, that way. Right. Um, and I felt like that was there. Um, I don't know, do you want to speak anymore? I agree, I'm, I'm the youngest of three. Um, so I, it comes very easy to me to be annoying. Um, to be sort of delightfully entertaining. It is the entertaining. baby dynamic. It is the baby dynamic or whatnot. And it, it, I think also for you in terms of being the one who stayed and then these two brothers being the one that left. Like Also there's the idea like the, the women usually tend to be the ones that sort of like take on that role of caretaker or whatnot. And then you're sort of the tie that Societally binded Societally assigned. Us. Societally assigned. But you're also sort of, you're the bridge between the two of us. And now that you're gone, we have to find a way to sort of connect with one another. So, 
Yeah. Well said, well said. All right, we're gonna go to the audience question. So this first question is for you, Jeffrey. You ready? I hope so. Okay, <laughs> let's do it. It's, it's, it's from Mr. Samuel Leggett from JBS Media, and he wants to know, Jeffrey, uh, how do you feel the character of Monk has impacted you personally? Ooh. He's such a realistically flawed person that wants to be recognized to a fault, but is also appreciative and loyal to his family and friends. Uh, did you just read my biography? <laughs> um, uh, you know, I guess we're still very much in the process um, with this film. Um, you know, we made it uh, a little over a year ago now. Um, but the process isn't complete. The circle isn't drawn until uh, audiences receive it. So, you know, I'm still on the ride. But it is one of those... It's one of those wonderfully strange things that happen often when we work, when perhaps we are doing what we were supposed to be doing, when there is so much overlap between his life and mine in ways that I care not to divulge too, uh, too terribly. But there's just, um, um, I don't know, I think in terms of how it's changed me, um, it remains to be seen. Um, Do you tell your girlfriend that she's easy. your girlfriend and not your... Easy. <laughs> <laughs> not, not my bookkeeper. Easy. We <laughs> <laughs> learned that lesson. <laughs> Mr. Douglas. Mr. Douglas. <laughs> <laughs> I found him. <laughs> you guys have to remember, this is a global virtual press conference. <laughs> the entire world is watching. All right, we have another audience question. Uh, this one's for you, Corey. Yeah. So the question's from Rindy Jones from Rindy Reviews, and he wants to know, because so much of the film speaks true to being a black creative trying to break into the industry, especially the ones who don't want to be pigeonholed or, or be pigeonholed themselves, what from your own experience as a black artist made you go, quote, I have to put this into a screenplay, quote. Oh, I mean, so much. Three months before I found this novel, uh, I had received a, uh, I'd received a note from an executive that I needed to make a character in a script that I wrote blacker. And uh, that came through an emissary, and I, and I told the emissary, I said, I will indulge that note if you tell that executive who gave you that note to sit down in front of me and tell me what it means to be to blacker. Yeah. And, I, and, uh, and that note went away. Because I know that I'm sure that they knew they were about to commit a civil rights violation. <laughs> <laughs> if they were to have that meeting, you, should have said, you, you mean more Jeffrey Wright? <laughs> uh, oh my gosh! I had a <laughs> two years ago. I had a, I have a really close friend who uh, a couple years ago she's she's a black journalist and she has been trying to make her way in film and television, and she, she flew to Los Angeles to take meetings with production companies, and she sat down with this production company, and they, and they, uh, they said, you know, what are you interested in writing? And she said, well, I'm a child of the 90s, I'd really like to write an erotic thriller. Um, she said, I really like rom-coms, I'd love to write a rom-com, and they said, okay, uh, let us think of some things and we'll get back to you soon. And she said, great, and she left their office, and they called her about three hours later, and they said, we've got a great idea for you. We think we found it. And she said, okay, what is it? And they said, it's a story about a, a blind slave named Blind Tom. And thanks to a wealthy white benefactor, he learns to play the piano and he becomes this piano prodigy. And she said, and she, yeah. And she said, that's a, that's a weird erotic thriller. Premise for a rock band. Yeah. That'll be a strange erotic thriller turn. If blind Tom becomes the erratic killer. But, 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 you know, it's these, historical, these... historical. Uh... <laughs> oh, no, it wow. was. It definitely was. No, that's the, it was it was a true story. It's like the biggest selling like uh, uh, musical artist of his time or something. Yeah. Playing the white. I mean, Jerry knows that because I, I, I took that project. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, that's fucked up. This shouldn't say that to you. Well, real quick, now that we've gone in this direction, I, I did have one. No, but I, that's, all, that's all 
just to say that 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 you know this was that was two years ago. The the person telling me to make the script person in my script blacker was three years ago. You know, this wasn't fifty years ago. This is this was during the time of COVID. So, uh, you know, the you know people are like, oh yeah, it's a satire, and yes, it is a satire. There are sort of like moments of exaggeration, but. Not that much, you know. That, that's that's stuff that could easily have gone into the film and sort of worked with the story that we're telling. So, there, you know, I think that people think that this is, you know, it is not far off the mark. I'll say that there is a lot of me in the movie. There's a lot of my personal experiences, just sort of like me all over the place. And 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 I've dealt with this a lot in my career, as I'm sure a lot of other people do. No, I'm glad you touched on the uh, satire aspect. I was going to ask a question about that and go deeper, but. We don't have a lot of time for that, so I, I think you alluded to that with the answer to that question. But one thing I want to touch on before we do get to our last question from the audience is, I do want to ask Erica and Jeffrey to touch on how they work together as a couple in this film to make black love look so authentic and real in this film. You first, Erica. I'm more somebody, butter. <laughs> 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 you know, yeah. Yeah. You know, the truth is, it's easy to love Jeffrey Wright. So I'm talking about the character Monk, who's a little bit more difficult to love. But if you remember, Coraline met him before she met the actual man, because she read his books. And so he'd already seduced her in some way. And so I think that I had to remember that, even though I get to learn who he is. And... Um, I, I love that they do meet cute. She drops the vegetables and he comes to pick them up and they talk over wine and that type of thing. And they get to know each other. It's a very mature relationship. And um, that shouldn't be an act of resistance to see that type of thing, but it is. And uh, Jeffrey is, is a very, um, he's an interior guy and so is Monk. And so you don't want to do too much because I think a lot of what they do is is unsaid. They've lived a life. She's come from a divorce. She's a public defender, so she's, you know, accomplished. But she's trying it out, and she, I think, is willing to take a risk on, you know, maybe a new relationship. But he has to meet her there, truthfully. And I think that that, that matters. It's a beautiful, you know, conversation on set because it just happens sort of naturally, and we didn't really talk about it. Well, I've, I've been an admirer of, uh, of Erica since. The public theater, uh, Joe Pat, Pat, Forbidden City was that? Was that? The, um, which was that was last Thursday. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and, and I mean, Erica just has so many qualities. Um, you know, the humor, the irony, but also this strength about her that is um, is uh, is very alluring. And for this piece, um, just perfectly suited so as she described monk is you know he's a bit of uh you know he holds his cars close to the bed he best he's a bit introverted um and but i, I liked that she had um she, these qualities to bring him out but also in the course of events of course to push him to push him away there was a strength there kind of an old school um um i mean i think of uh of of, of the actor that comes to mind is, is Patricia Neal, who had that kind of, you know, that kind of forcefulness uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, about her, as well as beauty. And so it was, you know, um, again, you know, we had an incredible group of actors here. Uh, not only the incredible actors that are seated here, but the guy who plays Ned in the bookstore. I mean, they were just so wonderfully, everyone, every, to the smallest, uh, smallest detail was just wonderfully suited. So really, um, what we did, Eric and I, as we all did, was we just, we, we got together, the camera rolled, and, uh, and yeah. we looked at one another when we did our work. Um, it was just a, just a fantastic, fantastic um, collaborative circle that Cord created for us. Thank you. Real quick, Cord, um, American Fiction, that's a really dope title. Was that always the title you had when you opened the laptop and, uh, uh, page, and it was a blank screen? No, all the, the title, the, the, the script that all these guys got was called Fuck. <laughs> That's true. That was on the slate. Yeah. Fuck, like, <laughs> shot with fuck on the slate. 100%. 100%. Fuck on the slate. It's going to be my nine and a half weeks. You hear me? 
<laughs> Stay tuned for the sequel. <laughs> so Adam, when you got this threat and said, what was your reaction? Well, I wonder what they're going to call it. <laughs> 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 and, and John, you, you, I mean, you play you you play the agent in the film. What did your agent say when you got this? What did he script? say? Yeah, what did he say? He said, uh, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I love it, I love it. I, I need one of those original screenplays with that title on it. I love that. We'll talk later. Right, here's another question from the audience. This is from, uh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> this is from Leah Mendoza, and this is a question to all of you, so um, we'll figure out some sort of way who goes first, who goes second, who goes third. Can I go first? But, yes. <laughs> you know why you go first, right? I, I'm gonna go first because I actually have to excuse myself. Oh, that's right. Yes. In just a moment, because my okay. baby boy is in the playoffs for his flag football. Yeah. 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 Uh, God bless you all. Appreciate it. And I'll go first. And okay. You fill in, and we'll keep this party going. Sure. I was gonna let you go first because you were from St. Louis, but I appreciate that, Kansas City. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate sure. that too. All right. Well, here we go. Here's the question. After finishing the, this is a really great question, by the way, from Leah Mendoza. After finishing filming American fiction, what is the one thing each of you learned about yourselves as actors that you will carry with you the rest of your careers? Good question. Nice softball one before I got to get out of here. <laughs> I would say uh, happiness is not a possibility unless you're willing to live your authentic truth. That's what I learned from Cliff and that's what I hope to carry throughout my life. God bless you all. I love you all. Adam, you did not. Um, what did I learn that I'm going to take with me the rest of my life? Yes, yes, sir. 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 It's not my question, sir. It's question. I don't know. Like Jeffrey said, I'm still learning. I'm still. Uh... <laughs> That's it? <laughs> what did I take that for the rest of my life? I'm not sure yet. I really am not sure yet. Okay. Um, I'll get back with Hopefully you. some of these lovely relationships that are blossoming. Yeah. That's correct. Okay, we'll, we'll revisit that a year later, okay. five years later, <laughs> ten years later. Like, remember that question from the American Fiction press conference? Well, well, how about this? What did you have for lunch that day? <laughs> I knew the day was done. Yeah, I think I just went back to the hotel. So far, some, it was, it, we filmed it in Boston, so I probably had their clam chowder. <laughs> <laughs> That's very life-affirming. Okay, what about you, sir, John? Uh, you know, um... A bunch of stuff, I think, but one thing that, the first thing that popped into my head was how I think I need forever to prepare for a role. Uh, and when I get forever, I still need more time. Um, and we didn't, I didn't have any time, really, to do too much prep. I, I read the novel, um, I met Cord for dinner, two days before shooting, and I saw Jeffrey uh, for the first time in the makeup trailer a couple of hours before camera started rolling. But we knew each other. For but we knew each other for over 20 years, 25 years. And actually, that's, I think, a big reason why I think it turned out the way it turned out in terms of the, the dynamics between them. But what I learned is, because of that, if you tune into the things that really matter, and I said earlier it's about the personal, and in this case I was fortunate enough that I had a great deal of the personal, whatever that means to you. For me, knowing Jeffrey for as long as we knew each other, and I could lean into that. I, de I definitely didn't want to make him an agent that I saw before. I met lots of agents in my life. I thought they were a lot more interesting than the ones that I would see on TV and film. And there was a lot of great humor in, in Arthur and in those scenes. And I thought, you know, for a, a professional relationship to be free enough to 
laugh the way they laughed or 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 deliver those funny lines to each other. There's got to be some kind of a, a familiar nature to their to their relationship that goes a little deeper than just the ten percent that he's going to earn from his book and and so many other layers. So 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 I learned that you trust what you've got, lean into the personal, and when you're surrounded by people who are great, to flush fear down the toilet bowl mm. and jump in. Not in the toilet bowl. <laughs> <laughs> well said. Very well. And thanks for those instructions at the end not to jump into the toilet bowl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, Eric. <laughs> Up next. Uh, that, Top black next. that black showbiz gives you more. Yeah. It's always had to. It's the burden of being here on this uh, in this world, on this planet, certainly. And I think the 13% African Americans are some of the biggest culture makers in world history. Yeah. And we continue to ask these important questions and put up defining pieces of work that tell a story about us, but also tell a story about the world. And we need more of that. We need to support them. And, I learned that more and more and more because, you know, this may uh, look like a family story and all that, it is, but it's a very difficult story to tell because it just needs the delicate part of what we have. We're often asked to be the hammer. Mm -hmm. Jeffrey Wright, you call him, he's a hammer. He's a builder, he's an architect. And he's done all that work to come in and be a man, a brother, a lover, and all these beautiful things that he is. But he's got to bring all that to bear to have this conversation. So. Thank you, Core Jefferson, Percival Everett, for creating that space. But yeah, you've got, we've got a lot to do in any one thing. So well said. Thank you very much. Thank you us. Um, it is better than you think uh, to work with incredible talent, um, to be able to surrender into the being and not the acting. Um, and it's, it was an honor. It just really, it was a treat for me. And I will also say I went home last night after our, the panel we did last night, and I text one of my best friends, and she said, how was it? I said, you know, it's extraordinary to sit with stellar humans and be able to listen to not just to have seen the work that you do, but to know that the work that you do is informed by the extraordinariness of who you are. Um, and I really felt that about um, Cord, you know, it takes a particular hand, a particular amount of um, selfhood to be able to have the courage to stick to who you are in material. And we felt it. And to be able to be in a project where our internal life and not having to speak our internal life, but just have it in a project, I haven't had a lot of experiences with that. And then to see it on screen and know that it is more powerful than you even feel. Um, so I've learned a ton from this. And like Jeffrey, I will continue learning because we didn't all get to work together. And now I just get to be in this. And I sit here like an audience member, just listening um, and learning from people that are way smarter than me. Thank you so much. All right, last but not least, before you guys want to say, um, Thank you so much. I mean, you mean a lot to all of us, but particularly to me. Um, watched you do what you do. Definitely impacts me. Reason why I'm sitting in this chair. So just want to say thank you. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Um, I, don't, I don't know what to say to that. I mean, when I was, I hear things like this and I'm really appreciative. It just reminds me, I guess, of how old I am. Um, <laughs> how long I've been doing this, but when I was told that, you know, Tracy was to play my sister, when Erica was to join to play Coraline, when, when Sterling was to join, when John, when, when everyone, Leslie Uggams and Adam, everyone was, I, I, I was surprised, really, um, at the quality of talent that was coming on board simply because like, really, they want to come? Mm. This was a very personal story. Uh, uh, you know, back
back to that point, I don't know what people watch, but they appreciate and have appreciated what I do. For me, what I've learned um, over time, what I've gotten better at, is yes, I can interpret a script, but what I've gotten uh, better at and what I find to be even more critical is finding um, the collaborators to work with that will allow us all to do our best work and to enjoy it. Mm -hmm. And this experience only reinforced that for me. Uh, and I don't just mean, you know, the actors here, but also the crew. There was a sense of, of community that can be wonderful on a movie set, and it can also be incredibly cynical and cold and strange. Movie sets, people who are outside of our business don't really appreciate that film crews are among the hardest working people in across any industry. They work tirelessly, they work often you know, without thanks, but um, when it's done right, and when we all come together, whether there's a carpenter over there, an electrician there, the, the, the teamster who, you know, who's driving us, everyone comes together, um, cinematographer, oh, we, we, we all come together as, as this microcosm, and when we start to do something that we think is interesting, we think is new, we think might be good, there's an extra level of pride that enters into the work, an extra level of care for detail that I find to be really magical and really gratifying um, because my role at the center of it is to just do what I do but without all the components uh, conspiring together it's really meaningless and so I, I, I learned I guess uh, from this experience and, and Cord, you know, Cord created this opportunity from, from, from the air and from a book and he had the tenacity, the wit and the wisdom to get it done, to recognize that this was a story that wanted to be told, but also wanted to be seen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. And without him, we're not here. It's the collaboration. Yes, the play is the thing, but also the collaboration is the thing. And that's what I'll take away from this. Yeah. 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 Well, sadly, we are out of time, so I would like to say thank you, Adam. Thank you. For joining. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Thank you, John, for joining. Thank you, Erica, for joining. Thank you, Tracy, for joining. Jeffrey, thank you very, very much for joining. And ladies and gentlemen, the lecture, Mario, Paul Jefferson, thank you for your joining. Thank you for your conviction. Thank you for joining us. Thank you all so much for coming. Oh, thank you. I appreciate thank you all. Thank you so much.